We're going to continue in this conversation about the church, the identity of the church, who the church is. Last week, we discussed the book of Exodus, the, the building of the tabernacle, the wardrobe of the priest, and we discovered there was three primary colors that God wanted to design into the tabernacle and on the priest. He wanted the priest to match the tabernacle and the tabernacle to match the priest. And the three colors he used primarily woven through all of the material that Israel was called to build the tabernacle with and to dress the, the um, priest with were blue, purple, and scarlet. Those were the three primary colors. Blue represents the faithfulness of God. Purple represents the royalty of God. Scarlet represents the blood of the sacrifice. And we discovered last week that word scarlet in that scripture in the original Greek means tola, and tola means crimson worm. And crimson worm was squeezed and the blood was extracted from that worm and it was woven into the material to make the scarlet color for the tabernacle and for the priest. But we discovered last week that that worm had a great significant meaning because that crimson worm has one purpose in life to, and the one purpose in the life for that crimson worm is to climb onto a tree, attach itself there, and die, and that all of its young would feed off of its dead body for three days, and after that three days of feasting off of its dead body, it would leave a stain on the tree, and then every young one that fed off of the mother's body would now be identified as a crimson worm, exactly like her mother exactly an identity to who she is. In other words, it, that worm didn't die and produce a dog. It produced more worms. It produced after its own kind, after its own likeness. And so God wasn't just trying to be, I don't know, what's the word, ladies? Cute with his decorating. He had a purpose within his decorating because, as we discovered last week, what you decorate, how you decorate in your house has everything to do with your desire. You don't paint your walls purple if you don't like the color purple, right? And if I came to your house and said, hey, change that color of that wall, I don't like it, you're going to say, there's the door, buddy. This is my house. You don't come in telling me how I'm going to do my house colors, Right? So you design your house and you decorate your house based upon your desire. God was giving us an insight that he wanted his priest and his tabernacle to look exactly like what he desired. And Jesus, in Psalms 22, is a prophetic word, and it says, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we hear Jesus say that on the cross. So Psalms 22 is a prophetic utterance of what Jesus was going to go through on Calvary for you and I. And Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then in verse 6 it says, But I am a worm despised and rejected of men. I am a worm despised and rejected of men. See, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he humbled himself to the place of a worm-like state. See, you don't understand the amount of royalty Jesus left to come to this earth to be with you. It's intense. It's intense. He left perfection to come where imperfection was to make imperfection available for the perf perfection. That's you and I. He died on a tree. The crimson worm, she will take herself there on her own desire, on her own mission to reproduce children. Jesus didn't have anybody say to him, go, Jesus, go to the cross. You can do it, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Get up there and die. You can do it. Jesus says, no, Father, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go willingly to that tree. And when I lay my life down, my blood's going to be stained on that tree as a representation of that which I'm dying for is now going to become like who I am. And on that fourth day, that crimson worm, the tail will go up into its head and it will form a heart-like shape. And its body will turn like a waxy wool white color. 
and its body will flutter to the ground and die after it's given new life to its children. The Bible says, come now, let us reason together. Though your sin be red as scarlet, I will wash them and make them white as snow. What's Jesus saying? The only place that the church can be made holy is when we surrender to who he is. He's a holy God. And he came for an unholy people. An imperfect people. He came for an imperfect, unholy people, and he lays himself down in order for you to take on all the attributes of who he is. And then Jesus comes, and now he is the high priest. He is our high priest, robed in majesty, sitting at the right hand of authority and power by the Father. Right now, he's praying and interceding on your behalf. Father, let them know I love them. Father, let them know they can be faithful today as I was faithful. Let them know that no weapon formed against them is going to prosper, but that every tongue that rises up against them in judgment, I will condemn. Let them know that I am for them and I am not against them. Let them know I, you, they are loved. Let them know... Remind them today to look at the cross and remember what I have purchased on their behalf. They're feeling down today. I don't want them to feel down today. There's no reason for them to feel down today because I have made them victorious in Christ Jesus. There's no reason for us to be down. You say, Justin, you don't know what I'm going through. It's not about what you're going through. It's about what he went through. What he went through speaks louder than what you're going through. That's how we live and move and have our being, not based upon what we're going through, but based upon what he went through. How many of you know some days it's not easy? How many of you know some days the devil's just knocking at the door? How many of you know some days things don't go the way you want them to? How many of you know some days you don't feel well? Things come up, bills need paid. But let me tell you something, folks. None of that has any matter, any value to knowing who he is. He is greater than your electric bill. He is greater than your car payment. And when we make the gospel about us getting our needs met rather than the gospel becoming like him, then we miss the gospel. He did not come to give you a nicer car. He came to make you exactly like him. And we are called to be the church that follows our master. What's a disciple? It's a disciplined one who follows the master. We're disciplined in our life. We carefully examine what pleases him. Where he goes, I want to go. What he does, I want to do. What he says, I want to say. How he lived, I want to live. Why? Because when he died, he didn't die for me to stay the same. He died for me to come to where he's at. So the church needs to get this out of our mind that we are here to get everything we need on this earth. We are here to spread who he is in heaven on this earth. We're to shine like he shined. We're to live like he lived. The Bible says, Jesus says, ah, the son of man, you, you, you want to follow me? Listen, dude, I don't have a place to even lay my head. Birds have nests, foxes have holes. Son of man ain't got no place to even lay his head. You want to follow me? I don't know about that now, Jesus. This ain't the Hilton. Jesus said, if you don't want to drink of my blood or eat of my body, you have nothing of me. People are like, we're out of here. He's a cannibal. But what's he saying? Apart from him, if we don't position ourselves as his young under his bloodshed body and eat from his sacrifice every day, then what we do is we miss the opportunity to become like him. Jesus never came to make a church that's half in the world and half in heaven. He came to make a church that looks like him. He wants the tabernacle to match the priest. Amen? That's the review in a nutshell. God desires a people that's separate. Somebody say, I'm a separate people. This morning, I want to talk to you about the separated bride Oh, the bride separate for his purpose. Okay, guys, all of you who are married in here, 
If your wife went out right now and said, honey, I love you, I love you, I love you. Thank you for giving me this house. Thank you for giving me these kids. But I've met somebody and I'm going to go stay with him. This in the room. Woo! Guys are like, where's my knife sharpener? And where does he live? Right? Why? Your wife belongs to you. You're in covenant with her. So now she, you, you want her to stay with you because of her love for you, not because of an obligation of what you can give to her. I had a dream the other night. <laughs> And it wasn't Martin Luther King. I kid you not. It wasn't. But I did have a dream. And I don't usually share my dreams. But I'm going to share this one because it was so clear to me what the Lord was saying in this dream. And in the dream, I was with my father-in-law and I was with my oldest daughter. And we were together, but Jenny wasn't with us. And in my heart, in my dream, I just thought, there's something not right. Why is my bride not with me? Why is Jenny not here? And in my heart, I felt like we had separated. There was something there. She wasn't with me anymore in my dream. So I called her. I knew where to call her. I called her, and she answered the phone in the dream. And she said, hello. And I said, hey, how you doing? She said, I'm fine. I'm in Atlanta right now. I said, Atlanta? So in the dream, my first inclination, I'm, I want to protect my wife. What are you doing in Atlanta without me? Like, that's a dangerous place at times. It's a big city. You don't even go out of Deschler on your own. Like, what are you doing? That's what I thought in my dream. And she said, oh, no, no, I'm okay. I'm with someone. And in the dream, my heart started sinking a little bit. And I said, who are you with? A man that I met. And as soon as she said that, my heart just, in my dream, I just, bah, I was broken. And I woke up. And there she is. <sighs> And I reached over and I go, don't go to Atlanta. She goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, maybe you do need to go to Atlanta. If you <laughs> Turn that way. But no, I was so wanting to be with her at that moment. And here's what happened. I got up and I began to pray. I said, Lord, that, that was an intense dream. What did that mean? And immediately I heard the Holy Spirit speak. He said, that's my church. That's my bride. My bride wants me to take care of their most intimate, precious things in their life, but they don't want me. I heard it clear in my heart, and I was even more broken after I heard that. I was like, oh my gosh. God, don't let my heart ever get to the place where I just want your hand, and I just want your blessing, and I just want your provision, and I want your protection, and I want everything to fall in line, and I want life on this earth just to be good, but I don't want you. It just struck me so deep. God did not design his church to be separate from relationship with him. The church only exists in relationship with him. A church separated from a bride separated from his groom is no longer in covenant. Father, I pray that they would be one just as you and I are one. And I pray they would be one in me just as you and I are one. Peggy alluded to this morning, John 15. Father, you are the, the vine these people, these followers of mine, they are the branches. You can't separate the branch from the vine. The branch only gets its life from the vine. The vine in itself is the source of the life for the branch. And anything that that vine produces, that branch looks like what the vine desires. You'll never see an apple tree produce an orange. You'll see an apple tree produce an apple. If that apple tree produced an orange, you'd say there's something not right with the tree. The tree's disconnected from its identity. 
And how many of you know the church, why people don't want to go to church, why people don't want to know Jesus, why people don't want to follow Jesus, why people are like, oh, that Jesus stuff, that's for them, that's cool, you're about it, that's not really my life, it's not really my thing. You know why? It's because the tabernacle doesn't match the priest. They hear more Christians complain and fight and argue than lay down their lives and be at peace with one another. They get tired of hearing about this guy over here was married. Now he's having an affair on his wife, but he goes to that church. So what happens is the world sees a church as disconnected from its vine and doesn't want, it has, has no desire to be connected for themselves. You and I are not called to get through this life just to get to heaven. We're called to be connected to the vine. That if someone's hungry and thirsty to know him, they got a tree they can go to. And that's right here and that's right out here. You want to know Jesus? I can feed you him. Why? Because he's feeding me him every day. I know who he is. I'm following him with all my heart. You want to know? I'm not just pretending. This isn't a pretend thing when I'm up here, folks. This is my life, Monday through Sunday. Every time I live, breathe, and have have my being. When I wake up, I think about Jesus. When I go to bed, I think about Jesus. I want him more than anything in my life. Why? So that when you meet me, you don't meet Justin. You meet him. I was over at the gas station, and this gentleman was over there, and he's, he's working behind there, and I'm like, good morning, man. How you doing? I'm fine. What's going on with you? You're pretty chipper. I said, I am chipper, man. And he goes, why? I'm glad you asked. I said, I'll tell you what. God has given me breath in my lungs. He's forgiven me for everything, and he loves me. He's given me an identity today to walk in his creation, to walk like him, to live like him, because I'm not defeated. I'm victorious. He's like, that's cool, man. Here's your, here's your change. <laughs> that's the, but what an opportunity. And I said, hey, man, if you're not doing nothing on a Sunday, come on over and join us. Why? The table's set. The table's available. Let me tell you something, church, though. We can't just invite people into this table. we got to go out and prepare a table in the midst of our enemies. See, the thing is, when we follow Jesus, when you go out and set a table in the midst of your enemies, they no, become, no longer become your enemy. They become someone that you desire as a friend. Oh, See, David wrote that in Old Covenant. I, I, I prepare a table in the place of my enemies. Jesus says, I give you a new command. Love your enemies. Do good those who persecute you. See, I don't live my life based upon David. Oh, you make a table for me in the place of my enemies. No, I live according to Jesus. No one's my enemy because I am no longer your enemy. And when people don't like you, you're just, hey, there's a table. It's set. It's available to you. I better get in some scripture. Matthew 16, verse 13. It says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or the other prophets. See, everybody had an opinion about who they thought Jesus was. Does it sound a little bit like our culture today? You would go up to somebody on the street right now and say, who is Jesus? They'd go, well, that's that nice man that works down there at that carryout. No, that's not Jesus. I watched an interview the other day of people on the streets, and they said, do you believe in Easter? And they said, no, I don't celebrate it. I don't celebrate Easter. And then they said, do you, do you know what Easter means? And you would be astonished. I know, I don't know what Easter is. Do you know who Jesus is? I heard of him. There's a world that does not know, folks. Our culture says don't force your religion down people's throats. You ain't forcing nothing when you just shine. All you need to do is shine and talk to people about Jesus. And they're like, who? They have never heard of him. All they know is his name is when they're upset. 
They use it in vain all the time, not knowing that they're using the name of our Savior in vain without any thought, without any even consideration. All they're doing is spewing that out. Why? They don't know who he is. So never say, never get this thought that, oh, they don't want to hear about Jesus. They already know. That's a lie, man. People are hungry for Jesus. People are hungrier now than ever for Jesus. You say, well, it's so dark. Look at all the bad things happening. Where the bad things are happening, it's an outcry for him. The Bible says that the earth groans and moans for his return. Like, we are groaning in our hearts for his return as his people. But people want to know God. They just don't know how to. So you and I, when we become believers of Jesus, when we become sons and daughters, we have to ask ourselves daily, Jesus, who do I say that you are? And he says this. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. Notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say, Peter, you're blessed because you thought of this all on your own. Why? Because that is the way of man. That's the way man thinks. I asked Jesus into my heart. No, 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 no. He came to you first and invited you into his. And all you said was, yes, you had nothing to do with the salvation other than believing what he has done. Nothing. Your good works, your good deeds, your good attitude, your good actions, your your bad deeds, your bad actions, your bad attitude, nothing stopped him from coming to you first. See, when we understand that as the body of Christ, nothing can separate us from his love. But we believe that our good works and our good deeds somehow give us greater advantage in the kingdom, when in all actuality, the only advantage we have is to know him. That's it. There are no big me's and little you's in the kingdom. There's only King Jesus and the rest of us. Amen? And, and Jesus is the head of his church. If I cut your head off right now, how long will your body live? Not too long. Seconds. Moments. You know what? Many churches are disconnected from their head. That's why when you go into a restaurant on Sunday, the waitresses and waiters hate to see Christians come in there because they're not connected to the head. They're connected to a building. They're connected to a religion. They're connected to a theology, but they're not connected to him. And then they come in and everything's about them. Where's my water? Where's my drink? This food is cold. I'm not paying for this. Or the waitress says, hi, how are you today? Fine. I'll have the bass. We're disconnected. Why? Because when we go into a restaurant, you know what we do? We shine. It's not about if your food is hot or cold. It's not about if the waitress is nice or mean. It's not about anything other than you're going in representing him. So if the food comes out cold, you eat it, you enjoy it, you pay for it, and you love her. Well, the service isn't as good as it used to be. No, it's not, but it's not on their end. It's on the church's end. That's why when you love people, they really don't know what to do with that. You ever have a waiter or waitress, they just didn't know what they were doing, and you're just like, you're okay. You're all right. Hey, thank you. You're doing a great job. And it's 45 minutes, no food, nothing. You're okay. I'm not here just to eat. I'm here to meet with you. 
Because I'm here to meet with you, there's hope for your life today. Because you ran into somebody who actually believes him. I'm not cut off from him. I'm connected to him. Now my life is going to reveal that through my surrender and through my love for you. I've had waitresses and waitress, or waiters, man, they didn't know nothing about what they were doing. Like, I, nothing. And you know what? I gave them a good tip, and I tell them I thank you. And a lot of times I'll ask them, hey, how can I pray for you? Oh, I don't know. We had a guy, who was I with dinner with? Patty and Julian, we were at dinner. Guy at Texas Roadhouse. He's in there and he says, he comes up and starts talking to us, doesn't he? I mean, this dude just wanted to hang out. Do you think that's by coincidence? Do you think somebody just comes up and says, this wants to lay out their life story to you? No, it's an opportunity. And I said, hey, man, how long do you work here? Oh, I've been here for X amount of years. And I said, you like it here? Yeah, yeah. And he had his arm in a sling. So what'd you do to your arm? Oh, I pulled a rotator cuff thing, man. Tore it up. I said, hey, can we pray for you while we're here at the table? Yeah. <laughs> he was ready, man. We just, you know what? What we prayed over him? See, when you ask people to pray for him and they quiet themselves, now you're the one talking. Now it's not an argument. It's a love cry. And I didn't say, God, make sure his tips were really good tonight. God, make sure his car doesn't break down before he leaves. God, make sure that everybody treats him nice tonight. No, we prayed over him. Lord, we thank you you love him. We thank you you're for him. We thank you, Father, for this service that he's given us tonight that we didn't deserve. We thank you, Father, that you, he is here. And, Father, we thank you that you're healing his body. We pray healing over his shoulder, God. We pray, Father, you would lift him up and encourage him tonight. And, Lord, if he doesn't know you, we pray that he would come to know you because you love him. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks a lot, man. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. We'll come back. We'll hear your report, how your rotator cuff is. We'll be back. It's not about the service you're getting from people. It's about the service you've gotten from him. How would Jesus approach you right now in this group? You know what he would do? He'd take his robe off. And he'd come over and he'd put a basin at your feet and he'd wash them. And he'd just wash them. He'd come over here and he'd do the same thing. He's gonna wash your feet. And he'd get down at your feet. The king of the universe humbled himself to serve you and I. Yet now that we have been served by him, we think others need to serve us. It's not how this works. We serve him now. So how's the response of the church? Before I get my plate first, it's gonna be a fight to who beats me there. You go first, you go first, you go first. Why? He went first for me. And you begin as his bride to think and imitate him as he is. Does everybody see where I'm going with this? You begin to think differently. You begin to act differently when you're connected to the head. Some of us are connected to the head. We just don't know what we're connected to yet. So we have to learn, we have to grow, and we have to process and mature in this together. Jesus says, you are blessed, Simon of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the all, somebody say all. The powers of hell will not conquer it. Or all of the design of the wicked one. Everything Satan came to do to separate you from him will have no authority over you. Isn't repentance beautiful? Isn't his blood beautiful? Because I don't live as a sinner anymore. I live as a son. Because of what he has done. But my sonship doesn't allow me to go do whatever I want to do. My sonship now brings me into a place of surrendering to my father. Turn with me really quickly. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to look real quick at verse 
21. I want you to remember this word today, illustration, illustration. Illustration is an example of, example serving to clarify or prove something. So an illustration is, what I can think of is like a, a painter. What does a painter do? He, he paints an illustration. It's not the actual mountain, but he's painting an illustration of that mountain. You, you wouldn't know the glory of the mountain until you stood face to face with it, right? But that picture is an illustration of what that mountain is and what could be available to you. It's an illustration of it. So God, if you understand Jesus in his teachings, he used parables which are illustrations of a like as principle. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's as this. It's not actually a loaf of bread. It's like a loaf of bread that can get a little moldy. Then you have to remove the mold. He gives you illustrations so you can connect the dots to what he's speaking about. That's the way Jesus always communicated through illustration. But here in Ephesians 5, chapter uh, 5, verse 1 through uh, uh, 20, is an illustration of our relationship with God as a son or as a daughter to their father. He starts off by saying, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. He's giving you an illustration. I want you to think right now in this chapter about an illustration of God being your father. I get that. Dad. You're my dad. I'm your boy. I get it. I understand that. So now everything I read through there, it connects me to a father-son relationship. Oh, imitate my dad. I know how to do that. I can imitate you. I can follow you as my father. And he goes down in verse 21, Paul all of a sudden presses the brakes, and now he goes into a whole other way of communicating. He says this, And further, submit yourself one to another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband, he is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Wait a minute, I thought I was supposed to be paying attention here to father, son, dad, child. Paul says, no, now I'm going to stop and I want you to think of it as husband, wife. I want to give you an illustration. People say, was God my father? Yep. Is God my husband? Yep. Is God my best friend? Yep. Well, how can that be possible? With man, things are impossible. With God, all things are possible. He gives us these relationships so we can understand our value and our creativeness and who he is to us and who we are to him. So he says this, verse 25, For husbands, this means loves your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Our husband, church, cr makes us clean like he desires. We're in a process of life to become like who he is. That's what we're called to be. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. When you do something wrong, does God have a bad day? Does, is God just crushed? Like you disobeyed him. Does he go, oh my gosh, my bride, oh my goodness. What am I going to do? Peter, come to hold me. Gabriel, I need you to sing me a lullaby. I am so broken right now because Justin didn't le listen to me. No, he's my groom. I'm his bride. So here's what he says. He says, hey, I'm going to be a good husband to my bride, and I'm going I'm to love her like I love myself. God doesn't have any lack of love. He is love. I'm going to love my bride the same way that I am completely invested in my, I know who I am. I am love. So she doesn't know she's love until she's connected to me. 
And right now she's broken because she's not connected to me. She's connected to herself in her own way that thinks seems right to man, the way that seems right, the way that she's going to get her way and not my way, the way that she gets to do life her way and not submit to my desire. That's why she's frustrated. But once she realizes that her only desire is me and my only desire is her, she'll have fulfillment and be able to move forward in this thing called life. Husbands and wives, we, we love one another as Christ loved the church. And he gave herself, his, himself up for her. It's a great mystery. Read down through here with me to verse 32. This is a great mystery, Paul says, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are separate. No. How Christ and the church are separate. One, so I say each man must love his wife as, each, as he loves himself, and a wife must respect her husband. What's Paul saying? He's saying, I'm going to give you an illustration. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you a teaching of what marriage looks like. But when he's all done, he says, listen, I'm not talking about marriage at all. I am. This is how our marriages should be structured and how we should posture our hearts in our marriage. But he's saying, no, 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 I want you to see a bigger picture. This is just an illustration. So when you guys see me and Jenny, what you should see is an illustration of him. Married couples, when you're walking down the street together, is how you respond to each other is a reflection of how you respond to him. It's an illustration we are written epistles for all men to read. So when we're out and about with one another, how we treat one another, people are watching you. I always feel like somebody's watching me. You know why? Because they are. You goofy, no good. Oh, here comes a member of the church. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> What do we do? Many times in our marriages, we forget that we're a reflection of him with how we treat one another. So Paul's bringing us into this illustration that Jesus came to marry you, to know you, that you would be one with him, and that everything he wants to do, you hold his hand and go do it with him. And now this thing called salvation is fulfilled through the groom and through his bride. Now, everybody who meets you goes, that's somebody who's married to Jesus. How do I know? By the way that they treat one another, that they love one another. Stand to your feet.